Certainly autism is one of the most challenging, um, pressing challenges facing society in Canada and globally, and it's a challenge really for which none is more profound than, than those challenges uh, lived with every day by individuals and families on the spectrum. And one central challenge is that of achieving accurate and early diagnosis. This uh, is exemplified through the story of, of a patient my, of mine. He's been well described in the, through the Children's Hospital Foundation Foundation as a sort of feature boy and family, um, and he was referred to me to see in genetics and uh, to provide some insights in terms of genetic assessment and counseling, but um, came to me at least in, from one consideration perhaps a little bit too late. He was the, the first boy born to healthy parents. You know, he f did very well. He followed normal milestones up until about 12 months of age. And it was at that time his parents became concerned that he wasn't yet saying mama or dada. So at 18 months of age, he went to the pediatrician. And that pediatrician became worried because that in, that toddler um, was really uh, not able to say much at all, just simply babbling couldn't point or use gestures and had really quite brief eye contact. By 24 months of age, Joshua became fascinated by ceiling fans, often staring at look for long periods of time, and he still wasn't putting any single words together. At 30 months of age, he started showing some perseverative interest in certain objects like paper or cloth, and he rarely approached those around him. Instead, preferring to parallel play, watching from a distance, until often going off and just doing his own thing after staring for long periods of time. By 36 months of age, he started developing some two-word phrases, and yet his voice became unusual, often strained and of high pitch. And by four years of age, he really didn't start to respond reliably to verbal requests made of him by his parents. And... Um, and it was really only at that time, uh, you know, when they noticed, too, that he wasn't maintaining good eye contact, that after this slow progression of features, that he was then finally diagnosed with autism. So really, after four years or so. Um, and, you know, tragically, you know, Joshua wasn't only referred to see me after, after he was diagnosed, but also after his younger brother, Christopher, who also had an established diagnosis of autism before he coming to see me. Despite a known family history, the autism diagnosis had been established, despite showing a similar slow progression of symptoms, and many of those becoming apparent in the first year of life. So both children very tragically missed a very key opportunity, a critical opportunity for access to early interventions that we know to be better sooner rather than later. And so this is really a story that kind of reflects one of the major heartbreaks of autism. We have to wait for this three or four year window and many periods of time for this evolution of symptoms before we can establish a diagnosis. And I don't know of many neurodevelopmental disorders as a geneticist where we're kind of mandated to have to wait that length of time before a diagnosis can be firmly established. And we know early treatment can make a difference. It significantly improves IQ, it improves language, it improves adaptive function. We know this in up to 30% of cases who are studied using, randomized studies, using the Early Start Denver model. And uh, although, you know, children still aren't being typically diagnosed until they're age three years of age or, or older, um, despite their high prevalence and, and ample clear evidence that early intervention leads to better outcomes. So it's trying to get to those interventions sooner where I think genetics can play a role. And part of the problem is that the autism diagnosis is complex and doesn't really imply etiology. Instead, it's derived from the presence of this highly variable constellation of behavioral and developmental symptoms that range from mild to severe. And we all know that they fall within the domains of social interaction, communication, as well as restricted and stereotypic behaviors. So there really is no one single cause of autism. It's increasingly apparent that autistic symptoms and behaviors are, are common amongst a large number of very diverse disorders. The Autism Society of Canada has shown that at least a 150% increase over the last five years. Um, these studies are backed up by studies through the, the Center for Disease Control in the United States, which now shows autism to be one of the most, if, if not the most, common neurodevelopmental condition with an instance now in 1 in 88 individuals. So that in Canada, about 400,000 individuals are living with autism and 80,000 of these are school-aged children.
The rate's increasing at about 5,000 individuals per year. And autism is found throughout the world in families of all racial, ethnic, and social backgrounds. You know, the educational and uh, social service cost per affected individual is significant. It estimated based on primarily American and British studies, a cost of about one and a half to three point five million dollars per year, more towards that upper end. However, you know, it goes without saying the personal costs are immeasurable. ASDs have been defined as one of the most heritable, most likely to be inherited, uh, complex neurodevelopmental conditions, with an overall risk uh, of ASD to siblings now estimated recently by Ozanoff et al. at the Mind Institute to be as high as about 18.6%. I've rounded up to 19%. That's something that we as geneticists knew for a long, long time before it was characterized by looking at some of those features that evolve earlier in, in life and realizing that some of those really key behavioral and, and symptomatic markers are indicative of autism rather than necessarily having to wait for the whole constellation of features to evolve. Um, and when we look at, at genetics, I mean, one of the key things that pointed to genetics from the beginning, and, and one of the individuals who had initially examined this is, is Dr. Um, Tony Bailey. And, and he, he, the evidence for genetics really was indicated from twin studies, where we see there's a much higher concordance rate in identical twins twins, close to about 92%, as opposed to dizygotic twins, in which it's about 10% or so, perhaps maybe now approaching more, if we looked at it with recent estimates, the 19 or 20% that we're seeing in siblings. And a, a prenatal origin of the disorder is supported by neuroanatomical and neuroimaging studies that have shown that these abnormalities stem right from the first or second trimester in pregnancy. There's no consensus on how variable or what we call heterogeneous um, autism is, either phenotypically in terms of its clinical presentation or genetically, uh, nor how many genes are, are involved. This, uh, this uh, figure here is to show you really that ASDs have a complex genetic etiology. And what that means is that it, they're due to the interaction of many genes and environmental factors. So no one single gene really can be tracked as, as a single cause of autism. I think we're going to see that genetics shows that our genes interact with each other still and also with environmental factors. So it's still not a simple task. So really, in general, the methods that have, are underway uh, now globally to help study the proposed nature of the genetic contribution of ASDs uh, focus on two uh, fairly basic hypotheses. There are approaches that have been done over years called linkage and <coughs> genome-wide association studies. And by linkage, we're trying to look for gene signatures that are similar between an individual who may have autism and other related family members, and tracking those signatures or the genes that they share that tend to be linked with ASDs. With genome-wide association, it's comparing common genes that occur with a particular trait. And, and usually, we're looking at it just uni, in a univariate way in terms of relationship to autism, whereas autism is so many different things, it perhaps takes away from the effectiveness of GWAS or these genome-wide association studies when we should be looking at features that are, are perhaps more broadly representative of autism and hopefully more closer to its origins. So the approach that linkage in GWAS depends on uh, is what's called the common disease, common variant hypothesis, which is really a method that aims to identify genes or gene regions in a small number of individuals. But these um, involve uh, cytogenetic, or sorry, um, these involve uh, looking at ASDs from common variants or common disease variants in a relatively small number of genes, whereas the common disease rare variant hypothesis is looking at a smaller number of individuals but for these rarer genes that may be more penetrant, using targeted approaches like cytogenetics or copy number variant approaches. You might have heard of copy number variants in the literature. There's been occasional announcements of changes on various chromosomes being linked with autism. Those still collectively have a very small influence because they're rare, but individually they're more penetrant to causing those symptoms. And, and we come to identify these rare variants when we look at some of these genomic rearrangements that are seen 
protein in, in our genome, these copy number variants, by teasing them apart further, looking at the genes, the integral genes that are contained within those copy number variants, sequencing them using whole genome studies uh, and or exome sequencing, and looking at, at genes within multiple or single instance families using some of these newer generation approaches. And we're starting to see how commonly these genes might be seen in other individuals that share the disorder. So really, autism genet genetics focuses on a merging of different approaches. We know autism exists with many co-occurring or comorbid disorders. It can be medical or syndromic in nature. It can be due to these rare genes that we're identifying, largely limited to the individual themselves. We don't often see that they're inherited from one or the other parent. Where they're more likely to be inherited is perhaps where there are these common genes that where maybe there's genetic alleles coming from both sides of the family and they get above a certain threshold and they interact with each other or with certain environmental factors that can contribute to autism. Or, you know, going back way in the early stages of autism genetics, even to simple chromosomal variants. So I thought I should go back to those first principal studies and explain for those who maybe don't know, you know, where all of this evolved from, talk a little bit about about chromosomes. Chromosomal changes were seen to be quite commonly involved in autism, and I'll explain what a, a karyotype is in a minute, but that's the term that we use when we're talking about chromosomal studies in, in individuals. We take it from a peripheral blood sample, but they're reflective generally of all of our somatic cells. They don't necessarily reflect always the changes in our reproductive cells, and there can be variations, but generally as a whole, it's a good indication of our genetic makeup. And, and the, the chromosomes can have changes changes in between 4 to 28 percent of cases, and the 28 percent of cases is skewed more towards those individuals who present with more complex medical problems, or they, they may have other things going on, intellectual disability, epilepsy, some um, dysmorphic features, more of that syndromic type presentation, whereas in incidental cases, perhaps a little bit lower. So this is what a, a karyotype looks like, and it's, you know, every human has 46 chromosomes. They come to us in pairs. Um, every pair, every chromosome has a fairly representative feature between individuals. They're shown here in this karyotype going from larger to smaller. Our, our chromosomes come in pairs because you get half from mom and half from dad. So that's how you get a nice representation of our genetic information from both of our parents. You also show in, uh, in reproductive cells um, your XY if you're male or um, uh, XX if you're female. And chromosomes 1 to 22 have no impact on, on the gender determination. It's the Y chromosome in males that determines that. One of the thoughts as to why autism was more common perhaps in males, it's four or five times more common in males, is that it might be due to changes that occur on this X chromosome, which in genetic terms is sort of unprotected, so to speak. If there's an alteration carried on that X chromosome, like fragile X syndrome or some of the other conditions that are carried, it can have an impact because there's no protective effect from a partner chromosome like females have. So that's why females can sometimes remain non-symptomatic carriers of some of these conditions, as is the case in fragile X syndrome. If I was to pick one of the most common chromosomal changes linked with autism, it's absolutely down syndrome. And Down syndrome is quite a major uh, chromosomal rearrangement. It's due to a lack of normal division of the of chromosome 21. You can see three chromosome 21s here uh, leading to the reproductive cell that ultimately gets fertilized. So two sticks in one cell and one comes along, say, from the sperm, uh, generally, because it's a more of a maternal age effect in terms of uh, affecting the natural division of our cells, causes this trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. So this is why it's important important. Even this, in this age of high technology with arrays and whole genome and whole exome sequencing, sequencing, to come back and do a basic chromosome test because it doesn't tell us anything about these structural rearrangements, so to speak, especially in cases like this where you can see pieces switched between each other, what we call a translocation. Generally, you know, people can carry these and be completely asymptomatic as long as the switches occur haven't disrupted any genes, okay? So in this particular case, a piece of chromosome chromosome 11 has decided it prefers living on chromosome 2, and, and that's by and large fine. You can carry it in a balanced form and may not show any symptoms, but if you start looking at the breakpoints where those change, where that change occurred, and if you happen to knock off any particular genes in that area, or on the alternative one where it's decided to live for a little while, um, that can have an impact and identify genes at those breakpoints that can be linked with autism. 
some, th some of these changes you can't see by looking at a basic chromosome. So the technology evolved from chromosomes using to, to what we call fluorescent in situ hybridization or fish testing. And literally that's what it is. It's fishing for small little targeted regions within our chromosome that might be out of balance. Because you have to remember with those pairs of chromosomes we get, you get half of your genetic information from mom, half from dad. And we generally, for any one trait about us, is coded by a pair of genes and that one-to-one -one genomic balance. Where there's pieces missing or extra pieces, one of the ways we started to first pick these up was through this fish testing by sticking little fluorescent probes on gene regions and actually seeing if they lit up under a karyotype to show two copies or if one was missing. The genetics of us, you know, our genes really are the blueprint for everything about us. One of the areas that are vulnerable to change is certainly at the tips of chromosomes. Uh, there, we see uh, changes occur as we age because they're more fragile over the tips. Um, um, but those that are seen with neurodevelopmental conditions like intellectual disability or in some cases, although more rarely autism, uh, they're not so much linked with age. There's just certain uh, variant regions in there that make them prone to disruption. And we see that in about 3 to 6% of cases. And here it's showing these little fluorescent regions that light up at the tips of our chromosomes. Um, so we've gone beyond that now too and then really where sort of the current clinical state of the art is in looking at genetics and autism is, a, is looking at these copy number variants where their co-occurrence you know, found you know, in the way of extra pieces or gains called microduplications or deletions called microdeletions is significant and still very useful for localizing all of these many different genetic contributors to autism. So this developed through this technique called chromosomal microarray for looking for these copy number variants or what we short form as, as CNVs. And this is where a DNA from a, a test sample and a normal reference sample are labeled differentially using different flora uh, fluorophore probes and, and they're hybridized to sort of a template where um, all various genes you know, from known genes or those from specific non-coding areas live and then we lay on the sample DNA and we see how they bind and stick together and the fluorescence intensity of the test and of the reference DNA is then measured and calculated as a ratio between, between the test and reference DNA and we're looking for these copy number changes. And what we're looking at is, uh, is really variations from that normal one-to-one -one balance. You can see sort of here that the test and reference sort of follow along a nice normal variation, except where you see deviations from that, it's giving us clues of where specifically in the genome there is either a piece missing or an extra piece gained. So something as simple and, and you know, subtle as that is significant. And this is allowing larger scale, more computational approaches for doing these kinds of genetic studies. And this technology really come into place more as a clinical base testing, although in a limited access. It's still not funded by the government as a, as a service. I think it should be. But we're finding ways to get this test done and doing it pretty well in every individual we see in genetics with autism. And it's important because there are a number of different genetic syndromes due to these chromosomal variants that also point to integral genes within them that are linked with ASD. One of the most common, if not the most common, rearrangement is a duplication on chromosome 15. And this is a hot spot that's linked with an autism susceptibility locus, whether it's either in deletion form or in duplication form, but it's particularly prevalent in those with duplications. The deletion form can lead to Angelman syndrome. It's, it's a complicated explanation, but um, that it's suggesting that there's dosage-sensitive genes there, one there in particular called UBE3A. Um, there are other regions involved too, chromosome 17, chromosome 22, 8, 2Q. I mean, really across every single chromosome in our genome exist genes that are linked with autism susceptibility and really just heightens the complexity for trying to find these various needles in a haystack. Uh, you know, it's one giant haystack with all these different needles. What we need to do is make them smaller haystacks and with lesser numbers of needles in them to make it more likely that we're going to find out what they are and more importantly what they mean beyond sort of just the general autism diagnosis, so to speak. What does it mean for that individual health plan for that, that person. And that's what these kinds of genomic disorders can help us define because it gives us sort of a template or a 
uh, a guideline, so to speak, of what some of the co-occurring health problems might be for the child. Here is a deletion at the very tip of chromosome 22. And here's a boy, I mean, you, you wouldn't really suspect much to be, you know, genetically apparent in him. You know, very quite a handsome looking boy, maybe a little bit more prominence to the ears. Uh, perhaps to those subtly are trained in these subtle nuances, we might notice a subtle widening between what we call the nasal root there or broadening, but really quite a handsome boy. And, and this is the case typically with this syndrome. We don't see a lot of change, and it's due to this region at the very tip of chromosomes, so still coming back to chromosomes again, where there's a piece missing. And one of the integral genes in that area is a gene called shank 3, which is a very important protein, uh, scaffolding protein that exists at the what's called the postsynaptic junction of the neurotransmitter. And it's important in the normal communication of the neurotransmitters between the presynaptic and postsynaptic area, and making sure that, that the message that's intending to be communicated is communicated properly. And here again, two more children. Again, very handsome children, not necessarily showing any obvious sort of syndromic or dysmorphic features. And it's meant to point out to you how, you know, not everything genetic necessarily relates to those with a family history or those where there's dysmorphic features or that kind of thing. It can really extend to the entire population of individuals living with autism. And, and this subtle, you know, uh, deletion has a subtle phenotype then. It can range from mild to severe um, development developmental delay, but one of the cardinal features that makes one most suspicious of it is that there's almost complete absence of speech, so what we call verbal apraxia. And you might see with it also co-occurring low muscle tone as well, another common feature. You get, as I say, these minor variations in physical features, but really nothing that stands out is obviously dysmorphic. They may have eye and ear changes, larger hands, dysplastic nails, you know, things that necessarily, you know, don't really speak to anything uh, etiologically until you do the test. And so this is what I want to reinforce, that the testing is important. And, of course, autism is quite frequent with this particular change. In the vast majority of cases, I'd say at least 80%. This is an area at the chromosome 7q11.2 locus. And it's a locus that in deletion form is linked with a syndrome called Williams-Buren syndrome. Um, generally, you get children who are smaller statured. They have structural heart defects. They have these uh, very cute sort of pixie-like face. Um, they have characteristic dental anomaly or changes, not necessarily always anomalies, but wide space teeth. Um, they have high blood calcium as well, too, that can lead to their muscle tone problems. And it's due to this deletion on chromosome 7Q. Now, one of the things that's a bit of a disconnect for autism is, is that they're described as having very much a cocktail party personality, very social. So by all autism measures, you'd think the furthest thing is away from autism. But when you look at it more deeply, you actually start seeing that the use of language is, is unusual. You go from this sort of social personality linked with a deletion of the region to a duplication of the same region. And this one is much more obviously linked with autism, but you go from that social cocktail party to actually almost mutism. Uh, really, again, selective mutism or a complete verbal, it's not really selective, but mutism, verbal apraxia, severe expressive language, like cardinal feature there, uh, just like with the chromosome 22 change. You get problems with the coordination of how they, they converge. Uh, and some minor congenital anomalies. And you don't see the same sort of physical features that you might see with, with Williams syndrome at all. And when we start digging more deeply into that integral region where these deletions and duplications, you can see that there are genes that are dosage sensitive whether that, and can link to autism behavior. So whether in deletion or duplication form. And we did some work in this area and found that one sort of ubiquitously expressed transcription factor, a phosphoprotein, was linked with that called GTF2I. And this has been studied in, in humans and animal models, and it's more and more showing this linkage with, with ASDs associated with that behavior. It's one of those more rare variants that have a greater impact. There are numerous other syndromes uh, linked with autism. Syndromes sounds like a scary word. It sounds like something a geneticist would see. But really, <laughs> syndrome really only means a pattern of features that fit together and have been recognized in other individuals. So it's a way of putting together all the various clues, okay? Really, if we relied on the ADOS and ADIR, those describe syndromes of behaviors as well, too. We just use a different terminology. Coming back to other syndromes, it, it, you know, we know that large stature is sometimes a very common feature. 
feature that we see in individuals living with autism. And there are certain conditions like Soto syndrome that also are due to mutations, an uh, NSD1 mutation on chromosome 5Q35, or occasionally a deletion at that, at that point. And there are some physical features that then point to some of uh, uh, the genes that may be involved, but within that area, the one linked with autism is very likely this NSD1 gene. Similar, while we're talking about genomic regions, we can also talk about single genes. And you can see the frequency of ASDs in the disorder is, is fairly frequent, whereas the estimated frequency of the disorder in autism, um, perhaps uh, less so. But for a number of different s syndromes, you can see how they overlap. Certainly the one that is the most common, as I've mentioned, is the Fragile X syndrome, where there's quite a high frequency of autism in, in, in the Fragile X and quite a high frequency of Fragile X in autism. Okay? And that's why, again, every child who's been seen, uh, being seen in genetics for, for autism almost always gets, or should, and, and most definitely gets a, a test for Fragile X syndrome. And here are some individuals that share that condition. It's shown by somewhat larger ears, a bit more prominent, prominent jaw in some cases as well, delayed fine and gross motor skills, some hypersensitivities to certain uh, stimuli. Um, hyperactivity, easily distracted kind of nature, and as well can be linked with vari variable degrees of intellectual disability. And some of these physical features don't become apparent until later. So again, it's important to do the test earlier because this is one condition too where we can be much more definitive about recurrence risk in other individuals. And if we ruled out Fragile X syndrome um, you know, in other family members, then we can be much more specific in terms of counseling for the family. Phenylketonuria, now kind of a non-issue since we have neonatal screening, but when it was missed way back when, um, it, it's due to a defect in phenylalanine hydroxylase, which is important for breaking down the phenylalanine amino acid in our blood. If it builds up, it leads to toxicity in the brain, and one of those features is children who can go on to have intellectual challenges and autism behaviors, where 30% of individuals have autistic symptoms. Again, another single gene change. Or the smith lemley syndrome as well too. Again, a range of various different uh, congenital features, but now due to a single gene change involving cholesterol metabolism of all things. Perhaps it's something related to the coding on our neurons, which we know to be very enriched with fat, to fatty uh, uh, acids and cholesterol and triglyceride-based components. So perhaps there's an integral uh, link there. So it's showing some of these biomedical type of relationships to autism. And, and here again, just a summary of some of the more common known genetic subtypes with, with ASDs. Um, again, reinforcing what was, you know, the frequencies that were shown in those tables. So I, I won't elaborate on it. The bottom line is, is that all of these multiple genes are, are linked through common pathways in some way. So we're not talking about discrete, rare causes. What we need to do is take a broader look at things. How do all of these various different genes interact in more of a systemic way to impact you know, brain or other functions um, that, that lead to ASDs? And one of the common denominators that's coming out of these studies, when we look at all these various approaches to, to genetic research, is that we're seeing a commonality through disruption of synaptic homeostasis, so how our neurons communicate with one another. And that can involve sort of looking at the postsynaptic transmission, it can look at ion channels, other signaling proteins in the, in the uh, synapse, uh, you know, how well the, the neurons become excited or inhibited. There are genes linked with every little separate component of synaptogenesis, but it doesn't still account for the complete explanation. It's probably a subgroup. If you're looking looking at autism as one big tree and you know, say that's the trunk, all of these various different limbs and branches and parts are, are areas that are, are intersect with autism and we're finding some of those branches say, but not the whole answer. It's going to be more complicated than that. So, you know, although the list of known genetic syn syndromes, uh, cytogenetic variations, copy number variants found in cases of ASDs is impress impressive, all in all, these still only account for about 10 to 20 percent of cases. And each particular disorder really accounts for no more than about 2% of cases, okay? They're still important to the individual, to personalizing their management, to providing appropriate guidance and counseling to the family, but they're not 
the answer still. So we still have to look for these commonalities. And you know, given the highly variable presentation, both phenotypically and in terms of expression, we believe that the, identify, the identification of the genes that are common or are involved in the more common cases, which are the 80 or 90 percent of cases, can really only be achieved by broadening our definition of the, of the disorder. Um, and this came from studies looking for, at GWAS and linkage studies where, where some of those early studies showed that there were areas of, of or some certain, I should say, subgroups of families that shared a genetic etiology that represented a more substantial number of cases. So the concept of subtyping or endophenotyping really evolved out of sort of the, the um, uh, psychometric aspects of, of the autism diagnosis. I'm suggesting that maybe we should look at it in terms of some of their medical and physical relationships because those are the things that are closest to the embryologic evolution of the individual and uh, the individual who later goes on to show these manifestations. And so the subgrouping today is really relied on indices from the ADOS-G and the ADIR, which are the gold standard measures, features from IQ or from adaptive behavior. But those features become blurred uh, over time in response to various treatments or in response to how the child ages. They're not constant. They're not necessarily always reliable. What is you know, reliable, perhaps, are some of those physical things. The psychometrics certainly is excellent in terms of providing a final best estimate process from these behavioral um, interviews that are done. They're really rigorous. They can lead to diagnoses that are reproducible and clinically useful, but to geneticists, they have no genetic validity. Um, and so as an example of the pitfalls of using that kind of data to try and, and apply it in genetic studies, one example is the role of identical mutations in a gene, again, a, a more neuroconnectivity gene called neuroligin, neuroligin 4, it's a cell adhesion gene. If there's mutations in that, you can get a wide range of clinical diagnoses. They could be identical mutations, but it can vary from Asperger's syndrome to intellectual disability, even within the same family. Family, and that was based on the psychometrics. We need other ways of looking at this. So that's where I'm coming to in the talk in terms of using deep phenomics. This is introducing this concept more of phenomics that go beyond those symptomatic descriptors of autism. And um, yet, how do we define them? As you know, I've said most of them have, def have relied on some of those psychometric parameters, um, but there is starting to evolve evidence that subtle patterns, what we call minor congenital anomalies, are really just physical variants that are so subtle to the naked eye, sometimes you, you, you wouldn't necessarily recognize them. But when you're starting to see them occur, they may be more indicative of, uh, as a more stable feature and more reliable feature of some of these um, the more complex phenotypes of autism. And, and we know there are other studies that have been done that have shown that some of these physical anomalies can be very useful for differentiating children who may go on to have more significant challenges with autism and more challenging um, behaviors. 20% of children have ch physical changes. It's, we, we know that from, from the literature, and we know that from experience. And, and increasingly, with all of the more sophisticated techniques that are evolving, 40%, if they come to see a geneticist, get all of the tests involved, it's perhaps as high as 40%. And this is a, from this, uh, a paper published back through the American College of Medical Geneticists. It's possible for up to 40% of individuals to, to uh, render a diagnosis. I think it's probably more in the realm of about 20 to 25%. But you know, we're getting better. And now with exome sequencing, it's certainly improving. And it's become really the current standard of care to suggest that every child who is being seen for autism in the United States gets seen by uh, a clinical geneticist. So that's my little plug in there. Um, mind you, there needs to be a whole lot more of, of, of clinical geneticists around to try and handle that. So, mm -hmm. How does that translate to here in Canada, but maybe the lower mainland? Right, no, good point to mention that. Um, it's not the standard of care. Um, there's lots of people who are becoming to recognize its value and importance, and, and yet it's still very variable in terms of the, the basis for families coming to genetics to be seen. I'd have to say disproportionately, it's still uh, professionals referring based on a positive family history, or they, they identify some physical change that suggests a risk. I still suggest, and this is going back to 
conditions that we know to be common, like the 22Q13 or the 15Q12 duplications, where you see very subtle changes, maybe none at all, may not have family history, you can still identify genetic changes that can be very important and helpful to guiding that, guiding that child's management in, in a more proactive and anticipatory way as opposed to a reactive, kind of too late, responsive approach. So it's hit and miss. So that's why I like to go out and give talks like this to broaden the awareness of, the, of this issue. So can, can, you, can you give me an example of if I knew a kid had 22Q deletion, right? If I mm -hmm. knew that, mm -hmm. how would that affect how I manage that child? I mean, like... Mm -hmm. No, good, good question. And it's a part of the talk I didn't get into, um, but I have talked about it in the past. And there are a number of different guidelines and standards evolving. I think they're helped by the interna international classification of function and the approach that's looked at for that. And, and there have been guidelines using that I, those ICF criteria to revise more um, functional approaches. So taking, moving from a medical diagnosis to one that can have a functional impact. There's, there's always been this dichotomy between medical and functional, right? I think genetics provides a nice melting point for that because we're the ones that sit down, we assess these children, we see the features, we go by our gut instinct, we, we do the test, we find uh, an answer. Often, I, you know, I think what's tragedy is where things are at, it's often left at that and it doesn't provide the answers. How do we translate to those measures that are important. And, and say for the example of Prader-Willi syndrome, that's a change, another deletion on chromosome 15Q, also can be seen with autism behaviors. We know that some things become apparent with that, that these kids have food-seeking behaviors, so that we need to control that to help control their weight management. By controlling their weight management, it increases their mobility and their activity in the playground setting. By knowing that they have a really high risk of social anxieties as well, too, you can develop approaches for that child to try and over some of those things. So again, general sort of guidelines that we know to be more common features that if you put them into an ICF template and deal with issues sort of personal, social, and contextual uh, can help the outcome of that, of that child. So that's the bridge that needs to be made between this functional medical stuff, identifying what is the issue, to translating it to something that's going to help the outcome and management of that child. And you know, as a geneticist, I never write prescriptions. I really don't. There's, you know, there's not a whole lot that we can treat except for helping to provide our, our, our guidance and advice to individuals who are in the school setting, who are in the recreational centers, to those who are working with children and families hands-on every day, and, and to help the families themselves best structure the environment and approaches to learning and behavioral management that are best suited to that child rather than kind of a blanket approach, right? Let's try and personalize it a little bit more. That we know that these minor physical variants are common in autism. They're subtle. They're not things that are obviously present, but you, to trained eyes, you can see them. They can be important biomarkers to, for early screening. And to the clinical geneticist, you know, these are important indicators of altered morphogenesis that can occur early in gestation, providing important clues to their underlying genes or env uh, environmental factors causing autism. They often cluster together. That's where they're more significant than when they're discrete or unique. And they show patterns suggesting relationships to each other and to autism. And, um, you know, I think there are exam many different examples of that. I think fragile X syndrome was one of the one that first evolved through this kind of, through this kind of approach. Some of the, um, some of the, the, the studies in the past have been really few and far between. I could put them, you know, maybe on one hand, maybe two at tops. They go back to 1977, the very first study. Um, and this was a, a fellow by the name of Walker who used a, 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 a scoring scale looking at anomalies called the Waldrop scale. They, he chose 16 various features and, and found a much higher score for individuals who have um, autism than a control group, suggesting that it's organic, right? This was a study that goes back and show that this isn't something that happens to you later in life or later in childhood. This is something that's indicative right from of developmental processes going back to embryology. The same thing was shown with links, but a little bit further information that some of the children had um, 
greater anomalies in their siblings, and those with higher anomaly scores also showed a higher incidence of lower IQs and, and more time spent in hospital. So this, again, is where this kind of information can be important as well, too. If you know some of these genetic conditions or multiple anomalies linked with them have a higher risk of intellectual disability or seizures or other medical problems, those can also impact management approaches that can affect behaviors as well. Same with Rodier et al., who's a Canadian who um, looked at uh, phenotypic features um, due to mutations in uh, um, embryologic gene, what's called a homeobox gene, that linked with development of the brain and face. And, and what was interesting there was that the gene that she found, a uh, Hox gene, also mapped exactly what certain environmental teratogens contribute to autism outcomes as well. And they showed that valproic acid and thalidomide were sort of phenocopies of some of these genes that had been identified as linking to autism. So where environmental factors can mimic the effect of our genes in some cases. So it goes to show not everything is genetic. There is, it reflects this commonality between things. And then the most recent study um, uh, you know, that has uh, been published is by Osgan et al. And they looked at seven studies with multiple uh, congenital changes in autism using a meta-analysis, so summarizing all of these various studies, there's still few and far between, and saw that there was a significant association of these um, uh, features, providing really the strongest evidence to date of a close association with autism and emphasizing the importance of their identification and understanding the variability of autism as well, too. It's helping to break down all the different contributors and that future autism research would significantly benefit from this. And that's, it's certainly been, you know, an important focus of our research. Um, I like this particular study study. This is with Judith Miles, who's down at the University of, of Missouri. Uh, she helped design sort of an autism diagnostic dysmorphology measure, an ADDM that was produced in the, or was published in JAD some time ago. Um, she's had long-standing interest as well, especially subsets of children that show that phys physical features are more indicative of some of these abnormal embryologic processes. And individuals with complex autism, um, uh, you know, having uh, perhaps more significant changes with, with linked with autism. Um, and she confirmed some of the same findings that we found, too, linking it with, with microcephaly or smaller head size. And what's important, though, is other than defining these physical changes to help guide complex versus simpler forms of autism, is that those who fall within that complex group do have a higher incidence of lower IQs, more seizures, more abnormal EEGs, and more brain anomalies. So again, impact acting outcomes and approaches to treatment by knowing that there's that risk there because sometimes seizures can remain subclinical. You may not pick them up unless you actually look for them by a, by a sleep EEG um, and there are many different overlaps there and if a, if a child's having subtle seizures and those zone out spells that we're all so familiar with, um, they're not taking anything in during that time period so it's really important to know and characterize. Um, essential autism is where it's more simple. Uh, you might see it as more heritable, coming back to those common variants that contribute to autism. Higher sibling recurrence risk, more relatives with autism, and a higher male to female ratio. And that uh, these are really important first steps for separating autism into discrete uh, subgroups that might differ in outcome and management. Just the basic classification into those who are more complex and those who are more simple, even outside of the genetic factors, although the genetic factors inform that. So we did a study way back when um, uh, looking at sort of some of these phenotype genotype correlations and we were interested from the copy number uh, variant perspective and are there more medically focused phenotypes linked with autism? So this was in a cohort of individuals that all had confirmed a ASDs using objective measures and um, we screened them for these copy number variants. We looked at it in 100 individuals and tried to see whether or not there was any phenotypic relationship between those that carried these copy numbers number variants and, and those who had more common or benign changes. And this was published in the Journal of Medical Genetics about five years ago, I think it was. And um, 
you know, we, we looked at these various correlations. Again, this is just saying the same thing that I just said. And we used a, a, a tool that had been defined by a, a well-known geneticist at the time linked for a study linked with intellectual disability. And he had a, a, a template that was being used to try and prescribe those in, or identify those individuals who had a greater risk of intellectual disability. We just kind of translated this to autism because intellectual disability and autism co-occur so frequently together. We thought, well, maybe Maybe there's a, a good yield here as well, and it, it relied on features looking at intellectual disability or family history thereof or of autism, looking at whether there was prenatal signs of, of growth involvement, postnatal growth anomalies, particularly involving the head, if it was too large or too small or stature, too big or too small, whether or not there are any craniofacial features of, of significance or non-craniofacial features suggesting other um, anomalies. And we, we linked a lot of those things with epilepsy, systemic concerns, and pregnancy concerns, and those kinds of things. And we found in these studies that approximately 9% of our particular study, which overlapped well with a number of studies that were coming out around the same time, suggesting perhaps up to 10% of individuals with copy number variants are found in populations with autism spectrum condition. And what was interesting was that these more pathogenic copy number variations um, showed a greater prevalence, so to speak, in females, okay? So that though, because Autism is also much more common in males. When you have an affected female, it suggests as well this heightened genetic liability or that they're more complex in some way. So that provided further evidence. Um, we saw an increased prevalence in subjects having smaller head circumference and intellectual disability. Typically, we see larger head sizes in individuals with autism. And that might just be a part, in part reflecting the rate of brain growth of individuals. And we see this you know, more uh, advanced sort of frontal to posterior, uh, posterior posterior, sorry, uh, growth in the brain of, of children with, um, with autism. Um, and we saw that the load of CNVs was more common in those who had more phenotypically complex features. So it suggests this kind of gene networking effect or an aneuploidy effect. It's not just a single copy number variant in some cases, but multiple copy number variants which uh, are leading to this risk. And this was just recently validated in a study not too long ago as well um, that suggests that it's more than these single variants that might be linked to autism. Um, so what we're continuing to do is looking at this in larger cohorts. We're continuing comparisons of subtypes with genomic variants and mutations and continuing on an approach to do more detailed uh, phenotyping. And it's because of this that I think, you know, it's becoming evident that the classification of some of the physical subtle features seen with autism um, is becoming more of an emerging area of focus in autism research. And it's, it's certainly been a focus of our research through the ASPIRE program going back over 12 years or more. And we've collected all of this data for many years and now are enriched with the opportunities of being able to apply it with, to some of these more advanced genome sequencing techniques. This is just a summary of, of what we do in clinical genetics. I won't get into too much detail. It's fairly basic stuff. We do a lot of pre-evaluation kind of work when an individual is referred to us. Um, if we want, if it's been for autism, we'd like to know if it is absolutely autism. We rely a lot on those objective gold standard tools. And, uh, and all of the various helpful um, psychometric tools to give us an understanding of the developmental uh, or behavioral phenotype of the individual. We look at family history, their medical histories, prenatal history, and then we go on to do a, a, you know, a physical exam, which is right from head to toe, measuring all kinds of different things, um, and uh, trying to look for these patterns that might fit together. And, and we complement that by our chromosome studies that we talked about, the FISH, the whole genome array, we always look for fragile X. Sometimes we, we can look for genes that are linked with Rett syndrome, although that's been kind of pulled out of the ASD spectrum. Kids have enormous heads. There's genes linked with a P10, uh, cancer susceptibility gene, actually, that's linked with autism. Shank 3, there's uh, any number of them now. And rather than looking at them discreetly, almost better is to do an exome sequencing approach. That covers all those protein coding genes within our genome. And kind of a one-shot deal, the, the trouble is, is that it's very expensive and you know a, a $2,000 exome sequence still costs fairly significant 
$100,000 bioinformatics. So, you know, there's, there's a, a big challenge there in trying to understand how all of this stuff interacts together. Um, and we do some other more medical-based screening as well, too. And where we've sort of extended beyond that more routine clinical approach and where we've involved and embraced a large team of clinical geneticists in our work is, is doing standardized approaches that kind of focus in on the features that we think are the most informative, although we've only pulled those out from starting fairly large. We actually started out doing 450 different discrete evaluations or measures and all the history components that we put together, and we've gradually narrowed them down to about 30 or 32 or so that is being most informative. We collect photos. The anthropometry is actual quantitative measures of the face. They look at sort of the... the um, bony landmarks of face and different things, whereas the a 3D craniofacial imaging system that I'll talk to you about just in a minute um, is looking more at some of the soft tissue comparisons. And this is a way of taking that gestalt uh, approach out of it and using more objective measures that could become more amenable to other, other groups to start studying these kinds of things. And we're looking on these phenomic differences that might be linked and, and linking them to the genomics and bioinformatic approaches, and including uh, hopefully um, greater numbers of individuals getting the sequencing. So as a clinician, we were focusing on an initial cluster strategy. We took all these 450 discrete features that we have. We th looked at their incidences between uh, uh, 5 to 60 percent so that we could ensure that the features were still thought to be significant, yet significantly enough to be uh, informative, and we started clustering them together. Um, we used K-means tests as a way to discriminate between various clusters that we, we identified. Uh, and we actually I, um, went and screened the literature as well, too, and looked at what we thought were more informative predominant features and compared them to the autism diagnostic dysmorphology measure that Judith Miles did and others have reported and strengthened those to be, in the end, probably largely craniofacial. Uh, it's not surprising that they fell in that range because that really is a reflection of the very close interface with the developing brain as well. So 75% of the features are craniofacial and, and uh, again, amenable to approaches where other people could start to use these objective techniques to help uh, uh, stratify cases of autism for treatment approaches. Um, we saw five clusters uh, that showed uh, you know, significance, three in particular. Um, the, the clusters that we found accounted for 98% of a proof of concept study that we did looking at 190 individuals with ASDs. Um, and we identified the patterns in those, in those uh, cohorts and, and went to um, uh, look at them more from a, a genomic contribution basis, not just limiting it to the features being present in autism as sort of the unique finding, but what does it say to their genetics? So we started doing some genome-wide association studies, etc., and pulled out, surprisingly, a much higher yield of genes with neurodevelopmental functions that, co that were found to coexist in the individuals that fell within these clusters. And so that continues to be our approach, but because the population is small, it limits the validity of doing genome-wide studies and linkage, et cetera. Those need big, big numbers, so we're doing more targeted genome sequencing and, and perhaps hopefully a smaller population that's more informative for its phenotype. So we're applying that to now about 2,000 probands. We have overall about 3,000 individuals that have uh, joined in in our Aspire consortium. Um, and those that fit best within the clusters that we're identifying, we're still working to expand um, beyond that proof of concept study, will be targeted for sequencing. And, um, you know, what we're seeing is that the, the face and brain really do develop in exquisite coordination um, with abnormalities or differences in facial morphology subtle, as I'm saying, not necessarily apparent to the naked eye, uh, being indicative of underlying brain pathology. Um, this was some of the 3D imaging that we did, and this was work that uh, we initiated years ago with Peter Hammond, who's at the University College of London, and we wanted to get more objective ways of looking at facial gestalt and seeing whether there were specific defining features, subtle, uh, that might help us in terms of predicting the neuro, neuro uh, pathways underlying autism. And so we took these 3D images using 
using a, a commercial 3D scanner, and we developed sort of this dense surface modeling technique, which you can see when the scanner takes the picture. It, it uses these digitized points so across about 20,000 different points of the face, and it reconstructs it, and that's how you get this particular picture. It was work that um, we published back uh, in molecular psychiatry some time ago, and it was a summary at that time of 72 boys and 132 first-degree relatives compared to about 288 controls. And we're continuing to build on those studies by continuing this work. And this, this picture here is just showing a relative position between the, the mean faces, I don't mean mean, but the average faces of, of individuals with ASD <laughs> versus those of, that are controls. And, you can, and it's plotted uh, in terms of that position difference versus age for this cohort of individuals. And so far we have um, discriminated, you know, distinct differences between ASD faces versus controls. Actually, a 79% rate of discrimination between ASD boys and their age and ethnicity match controls. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we used that then to look at it in terms of w in which in which domain or dimension did we see those changes. And so there was a color distance patterning al algorithm that we were able to apply. Again, you don't see the difference between the mean faces of the controls versus ASD so much until you apply these color distance comparisons on there. And, and blue is more prominent. Red is more um, recessed, okay? And we're seeing then uh, a more atypical right-sided asymmetry to the face of the ASD boys. Mm -hmm. Typically, everyone has a little bit of left-sided asymmetry and, you know, various reasons for that. But we were seeing a reversal of this in ASD cases. And where that is, is most prominent vertically between the brow to the chin, so more prominent through the forehead area and the super um, orbital area, more prominent front to back as well, too, particularly over the right superorbital area, and not so much in terms of the lateral difference, but you can see maybe just subtle little evidence there. And what was interesting is that unaffected sibs, although we need more numbers in that, but also unaffected mums showed the same pattern versus control mums as well, too. And suggesting, again, some commonality of these genes that might be contributing to ASDs. We didn't have enough dads to look at, but we're continuing as well, um, to see, well, what, you know, what is it that is perhaps more prevalent in these individuals, and can this be a unique subgroup, those who are showing this right atypical frontal pole asymmetry um, that might be useful for genetic studies. So this is ongoing work as well. What I've tried to demonstrate here today, just you know, to wrap up, are how novel um, you know, genetic and biological approaches uh, can be useful um, for identifying uh, and better unifying perhaps the various forms and symptoms of autism um, within discrete phenomic and genomic signature subtypes. Um, you know, this work really kind of emerged uh, in the community from a growing dissatisfaction with considering autism as sort of a one-size-fits-all approach to, to diagnosis. When, when we know we can and should do better for, for this population of individuals in terms of targeting early diagnosis and early treatments that can make such a huge difference. Um, and, and the research um, that we need really needs to advance that kind of approach. And it's certainly in the social and, and financial interests of government to help support that research too, although that's been lagging for sure and, and certainly challenged. So it requires research and understanding the cause of autism, you know, how and why it manifests from a whole person perspective, um, what treatments work and to whom they are best suited, and how we can apply those treatments to improve family supports and identification and management of lifespan needs. Um, what we hope might happen too from a benefits of a phenome genome approach is to differentiate characteristics within a diagnosis, the characteristics of children sharing the same diagnosis, hopefully address the disconnect between diagnostic information and the nature of the intervention so that we can help those who are helping children uh, in those interventions know what might be best suited to them and uh, hopefully pick variables that might be measure, better measurements of ongoing outcome um, and monitoring, uh, outcome measures and monitoring in, in the future.
We believe that learning as much phenotypically and genetically about each individual, each sibship, each family is really important to understanding the genomic underpinnings of autism. Uh, and we hope that we might be able to eventually realize this as a large community working together, refining the autism diagnosis perhaps in ways that are, are truly reflective of its, of its origins um, rather than sort of just you know, shifting tides between DSM-4 and DSM-5 and using those things. To me, that is still advocating a much more unidimensional approach for autism diagnosis rather than its multidimensional approach, which is so critical to understand. I, I mean, I, I, I think that's a wrong direction to go. Um, we hopefully might be better able to avert, anticipate and avert comorbidities, maybe unnecessary tests or burdens, maybe even save some costs, although none more significant than those personally faced by individuals and families by accessing uh, early treatments and improving the developmental trajectory of each, of each child. So I'd like to just end there and thank you.